But most of all, scientists were astounded by the giant hexagon, a huge hexagonal vortex. And more than that, one side of this hexagon is equal to the diameter of the Earth. It is present only at the North Pole of the planet, is comprised of thousands of smaller vortices, and in the very center of the hexagon is a giant funnel that goes deep into the bowels of Saturn for several hundred kilometers. The hexagon itself, depending upon the season, also changes color. It can be greenish, golden or blue, but the hexagon's shape remains stable and has lasted for hundreds of years. The seasons on Saturn change as on Earth due to the tilt of the planet's axis. When Saturn's North Pole is tilted towards the Sun, it receives more light. The sunlight interacts with the atmosphere and forms particulate matter, aerosols. It resembles smog, therefore it tints the hexagon with a golden orange color. And when Saturn turns away from the Sun for the winter, the hexagon darkens. The central funnel is always a dark blue, regardless of the season, probably due to the fact that a mist of aerosol particles is drawn in there like a vacuum cleaner. The symmetrical shape of the hexagon is due to the interaction of the planet's rotation and atmospheric currents. At the end of its mission, during the closest approach, Cassini transmitted photographs of these roaming vortices one after another in excellent quality. But how old are the rings? Have they existed since the birth of the planet itself? Or did they appear recently? At the end of its mission, Cassini gave us the answer to this question. We were very fortunate not to miss out on this marvel of nature. They are only 10 to 100 million years old. And it is possible that at the end of the time of the dinosaurs on Earth, Saturn was not yet the Lord of the Rings, as they are too light and too bright. If they were ancient, they would have already long ago become covered with dust and turned much darker. Apparently, Saturn pulled an icy moon like Enceladus towards itself and its gravity destroyed it, tearing it into small pieces. They were dispersed into orbit, constantly colliding with each other, as a result of which they were shattered into small fragments and the sharp corners between them became smoothed out like pebbles on the seashore. Cassini showed that the thickness of the rings varies extremely. There are millions of rings, and between them there may be gaps, but the rings themselves look like a vinyl record. The only thing we need to do is to find an interplanetary scale record player. Yes, Cassini has died, but its legacy lives on and still excites. The final images of the hexagon, the discovery of freezing rain, the study of the appearing and disappearing vortices, and the discovery of Shepard satellites showed us that Saturn is a single system. Yes, by looks it seems beautiful, and at the same time harsh, but this is an incredible world where everything is well balanced, from a small curl in the atmosphere to the finest specks of dust in the rings. Saturn is a unique creation of nature, and Cassini showed us that the whole world of this giant planet rests on the delicate balance of gravity. Only unity and harmony could have created such a true masterpiece in the universe. These were Cassini's final words.
There are seas, mountains, dunes, although not from sand, but from heat-resistant organic matter. And when summer comes to the North Pole, it even rains methane. It's an amazing world. Indeed, we are talking about Titan, Saturn's biggest moon, the second largest moon in the solar system, after Jupiter's satellite Ganymede. It is the only celestial body in the solar system, with the exception of Earth and Mars, for which the existence of liquid on the surface has been proven, and it's the only moon on the planet with a dense atmosphere. The diameter of Titan is 5,152 kilometers, which is 50% larger than that of the Moon, while Titan is 80% larger in mass than Earth's satellite. Titan also surpasses the planet Mercury in size, although it is smaller than it in mass. The force of gravity on it is approximately one-seventh that of the Earth's. Titan's mass makes up 95% of the mass of all of Saturn's moons. Titan conceals many of its secrets, but today we will turn our attention to its amazing landscape. Now the surface of Titan is composed mainly of water ice and sedimentary organic matter. It is geologically young and mostly flat, with the exception of a small number of mountainous formations and craters, as well as a few cryovolcanoes. For a long time, the dense atmosphere surrounding Titan made it impossible for the surface of the Moon to be seen until the arrival of the Cassini-Huygens space research mission. Scientists suspect that under the ice shell of Titan, at a depth of about 100 kilometers, there is an ocean of liquid water. This is indicated by some irregularities in the oscillations of the Moon in its orbital motion. Photographed by the Cassini in various spectral ranges, the surface of Titan in the tropical latitudes is divided into several bright and dark regions with clear boundaries. Near the equator, on the leading hemisphere, there is a bright region the size of Australia, which is high ground, probably a mountainous area. It was named Xenadu. In general, the surface topography of Titan is relatively level. The variation in height is no more than 2 kilometers. However, local changes of elevation, as shown by radar data and stereoscopic images obtained by the Huygens, can be quite significant. Steep slopes on Titan are not uncommon. This is the result of intense erosion in conjunction with wind and liquid. There are several objects that look like impact craters, presumably filled with hydrocarbons. Many craters may have been buried under a layer of sediment or were quickly smoothed over by intense wind erosion. The surface of Titan in the temperature latitudes is less contrasting. Titan has distinct indications of volcanic activity. However, despite the similarity in the form and characteristics of the volcanoes, it is not silicate-based volcanoes that are at play on the satellite, as on the Earth or Mars and Venus but what are known as cryovolcanoes, which most likely erupt with a water-ammonia mixture with a touch of hydrocarbons. Unlike the Earth, in the course of the change of seasons, powerful clouds of Titan move a great deal more along the latitudes, while on Earth they move north or south only slightly. Disappearing islands on Titan have also been a huge mystery for years. The largest of them is in the mysterious seas of Kraken Mare. The depth of the seas ranges to several hundred meters. Studies of the sea, Ligia Mare, have discovered an unusual feature. Bright island-like objects that appear and disappear in some radar images. Moreover, there aren't any significant waves on these bodies of water. There are two explanations of what they can be gas bubbles or solid floating formations. It turned out that at the surface the mixture exists in the form of one phase, but at a depth of 130 to 170 meters, the ternary mixture's state changes into a combination of two liquid phases and one gaseous. The solubility of nitrogen in ethene is much lower than in methane. It is emitted as a gas. Chemists estimate the diameter of the average bubble at 4.6 centimeters. 
This size is apparently enough for them to be visible to the radar. Nevertheless, researchers would like to note that there is not enough data to give an accurate description of the processes occurring in the seas of Titan. For example, the temperature and exact composition of the seas are unknown. More accurate data may be provided by future missions to the Moon. A new target of research is Saturn's moon Titan, to which the Dragonfly mission will be launched in 2026. It's expected that in 2034 the 8 rotor drone will land on Titan, which will receive electrical power by means of a thermoelectric generator. Becoming an eyewitness to these new discoveries will truly be an exciting and amazing time.
one of the moons of Jupiter, known as Io, played a significant role in the advancement of 17th century astronomy. Studies had shown that in the process of crustal compression, about a hundred mountains were formed on the surface, changing the landscape over the next number of centuries. The peaks of some of these, for example South Busal Mons, exceed the height of Mount Everest twice over. Along these same lines, there are vast plains on the surface of this satellite. Its surface has unique properties and comprises an abundance of colors – white, red, black, green and even orange. This distinctive characteristic is due to regular lava flows which can stretch up to 500 kilometers. The high density indicates that there is virtually no water on this satellite, although there have been small pockets of water accumulation found. This deficiency of water is likely due to the fact that during the formation of the solar system, Jupiter was hot enough for volatile substances such as water to evaporate from Io's surrounding vicinity, although not hot enough for this to happen on the more distant satellites. Correspondingly, often found on the satellite's surface are volcanic depressions, just like in humans, although they are called patterae. They are characterized by an even floor and steep walls. They very much resemble terrestrial calderas, however, it is still unknown whether they were formed by the collapse of the magma chamber and the collapse of the top of the volcano, like their terrestrial counterparts. Unlike similar geostructures on Earth and Mars, volcanic depressions on Io generally do not lie on top of shield volcanoes and are usually larger, with an average diameter of about 41 kilometers, and the largest, Loki Patera, is 202 kilometers in diameter. It is remarkable, but Patera often serve as sources of volcanic eruptions or far-spreading lava flows as in the case of an eruption in the Gishbar Patera, or they themselves fill with lava becoming lava lakes. The lava lakes on Io are covered by a lava crust which crumbles away and renews continuously. Image analysis has shown that the lava flows on Io are primarily composed of molten sulfur. However, subsequent ground-based infrared observations indicate that the flows are, in fact, composed mainly of basaltic lava and ultra-basic rock. An outstanding representative is Masubi, an active volcano on this moon of Jupiter, which is located on Io's leading hemisphere, in the Taurus region. The volcano is noteworthy for one of the largest lava flows, both on Io and in the entire solar system, covering an area of 240 kilometers. Despite the extensive volcanism that characterizes Io's appearance, most of its mountains are not volcanic in origin. The majority of them are formed as a result of compressive stresses in the lithosphere, which lift and often tilt portions of the satellite's crust, thrusting them over each other, much like giant ice flows. This is precisely why virtually all of the mountains of Io are at some stage of destruction, with large landslides being widespread at their bases. It appears that cave-ins are the main factor in the destruction of mountains. Believe it or not, but this tiny cheese ball, Io, plays an important role in shaping the magnetic field of the giant planet Jupiter. The magnetosphere of Jupiter absorbs gases and dust from the thin atmosphere of the satellite with a speed of one ton per second. All this matter depending on its composition and degree of ionization, ends up in the various neutral clouds and radiation belts of Jupiter's magnetosphere and sometimes even escapes Jupiter's system altogether. Also interesting is the fact that Io's moon is surrounded by a so-called atomic cloud of sulfur, oxygen, sodium and potassium, which extends to a distance from its surface equal to about six times its radius. These particles come from the upper atmosphere of the satellite and they are activated by collisions with particles from the plasma tours and other processes in Io's hill sphere, where its gravitational strength exceeds that of Jupiter's. 
Io's orbit ran its course within the radiation belt, known as the plasma torus, a donut-shaped ring of ionized sulfur, oxygen, sodium, and chlorine. The plasma in it is formed from the neutral atoms of the cloud surrounding Io, which is ionized and carried away by Jupiter's magnetosphere. It's not hard to guess that Io is not at all like most satellites of the gas planets, which contain huge masses of ice, as it consists mainly of silicates and iron, like the inner planets. Further still, its interior is also incredibly active. Modeling of Io's internal composition shows that at least 75% of the mantle consists of the magnesium-rich mineral forsterite, a composition similar to that of alchondrite meteorites. It is obvious that the ratio of the concentrations of iron and silicon there is higher than those on the Moon or the Earth, but lower than on Mars. The latest research has shown the presence of an induced magnetic field on Io, for which an ocean of magma with a depth of 50 kilometers would be required. This layer is estimated to be 48 kilometers thick. It makes about 10% of Io's mantle, and its temperature reaches about 1200 degrees Celsius. It is not known whether this 15% melting is compatible with the conditions of significant amounts of molten silicates in this inconceivable ocean of magma. Io is a bright and wondrous world, which has no equivalent in the entire solar system. Active volcanism on a satellite the size of our moon is absolutely astounding, and the pioneering photographs of the satellite surface, which have been obtained by a number of spacecraft, compel us to plunge again and again into the atmosphere of this distant and mysterious world. However, so far very little is known about how they formed and what is happening in them under the multi-kilometer shell. 
But all the same, the results of the survey were a real surprise to the mission's directors. No one had imagined that distant Pluto would not look at all like a smooth billiard ball, but would have an extremely complex relief, reflecting the history of its origins. In the new images, Pluto turns out to be covered with recently formed mountains, ice plains, methane ice dunes, and even icebergs drifting through nitrogen. In addition to that, the ice crust of the celestial body is strewn with countless cracks that looked like traces of recent tectonic activity. They were the first indication of the existence of a giant subsurface ocean on this dwarf planet. Soon other evidence emerged supporting the presence of liquid water under the planet's icy crust. But how and when it originated on Pluto remains a mystery to this day. But we now know that at one time Pluto was originally cold. This means that it grew slowly, accumulating ice material from the outer solar system, and at first there was no ocean on it. Water in liquid form only appeared on Pluto after the core of the dwarf planet warmed up as a result of the radioactive decay of aluminium-26 and gravitational interactions with its satellite, Charon. In this scenario, geologic faults in the celestial body would have retained signs of surface compression. Why compression specifically? The fact is that the heat emanating from the depth of the planet would melt the lower layers of the ice, turning it into liquid water, which as you know takes up less space. As a consequence, Pluto's ice crust would have begun to contract, which would lead to the formation of distinctive geological traces. And what have we learned about Pluto's atmosphere and climate? Pluto's atmosphere is predominantly composed of nitrogen, with minor traces of methane, ethene, ethylene and other gases. It is extremely thin. It has a pressure about 1000 times less than that of the atmospheric pressure on Earth. Nonetheless, it has great influence not only on the climate, but also on the geology of the dwarf planet. For example, it facilitates the equalizing of the temperatures of the different regions of Pluto and because of the greenhouse effect created by methane, the temperature of the planet's surface increases. Also, new data have demonstrated that some segments of the surface of the dwarf planet actually have snow caps, which are formed in a completely different way than they are on Earth. If on Earth, we are often able to observe the conversion of clouds into snow on mountaintops since temperature decreases with increasing altitude, then on Pluto there is conceptually the inverse process. Since the atmosphere there becomes hotter as the altitude increases, correspondingly, the physiochemical traits of the process of the formation of snow and snow caps on Pluto differ dramatically. In this case, calling it methane ice is the most accurate conclusion. And finally, it turned out that the change of seasons on Pluto occurs not because of the tilt of the planet's axis of rotation as on the Earth, but is due to the elongated orbit. Over the course of a revolution around the Sun, which takes roughly 250 Earth years, the amount of heat received by Pluto changes almost three times. As a result, the density of the atmosphere fluctuates significantly. In the long summer, which lasts a little less than half of the Plutonian year, the frozen gases evaporate and in the winter they again revert to a solid state. They evaporate from the most brightly lit and warmed areas and settle in colder areas. This process ensures that gases are carried over the surface of the planet and over millions of years have sculpted the most amazing forms of relief. What comes next? New Horizons has raised more new questions for us than it has cleared up old ones. But most unfortunately, no new missions to Pluto are planned for the near future. So it will be a long time before we get new information comparable in value to that which was received from New Horizons.
One of the places in the solar system that is worthy of notice and examination is located at an average distance of 250 million kilometers from us and stretches out for more than one astronomical unit. That is to say, the distance of the Earth from the Sun. This region is located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. As you may have already guessed, we are talking about the asteroid belt, a place where there is an accumulation of a variety of small celestial bodies of every possible size and shape. On May 3, 2011, a probe took the first photograph of Vesta from a distance of just over 1 million kilometers, after which an active phase of studying this asteroid began. By June 27, the craft had slowed down, approaching closer to Vesta all the time. And after another month, having already made almost two revolutions around the Sun, the craft reached Vesta and switched to an orbit around it at an altitude of 16,000 kilometers. All of July, the craft was engaged in photographing of the surface of Vesta. The probe confirmed just how large the Rhea Silvia crater in Vesta's southern hemisphere is, about 500 kilometers in diameter and 19 kilometers deep. The spacecraft also revealed that the mountain in the center of the huge crater, which the Hubble telescope had once captured, is more than two times the height of Mount Everest and is the second tallest mountain in the solar system, taking a back seat to the Martian Olympus. Upon closer inspection, the probe found a second large impact basin, now called Veninia, that is partially covered by the younger Rhea Silvia basin. These two impacts changed the surface of Vesta and probably almost destroyed it. It remains a mystery how Vesta was able to survive such an extraordinary cataclysm. It is probable that numerous Class V asteroids, debris from the impact, were scattered in all directions. Giant impacts have created dozens of gorges encircling Vesta's equator that were revealed in the probe's images. Some of these canyons rival the Grand Canyon in size, reaching 465 kilometers in length and 4 kilometers in depth. The probe's data also reveals that the massive impact formed Rhea Silvia a mere billion years ago. Thus, the surface of the southern hemisphere looks younger than the northern where a tremendous number of craters have been preserved. Previously, researchers thought Vesta was a substantially dry object, but the Dawn space probe detected water-rich minerals on Vesta's surface that are associated with carbon-rich material. These materials were presumably taken to Vesta by asteroids or comets from the outer solar system that is richer in volatile substances. On September 5, 2012, Having completed an extended mission, the craft broke free of Vesta's orbit and headed toward the next object of research, Ceres, a transition which took two and a half years. On March 6, 2015, having traversed a total of 4.9 billion kilometers at a distance of 60,600 kilometers from it, the craft was captured in the dwarf planet's gravitational field. And in early June, at a distance of 4,400 kilometers from the surface, the first photographs were already obtained. While the Vesta observations broadly supported the existing hypothesis and provided more details to fill in the gaps, less was known about Ceres. In fact, most of what we now know about the dwarf planet was provided by the Dawn spacecraft. Initial calculations suggested that Ceres might be separated into layers, although the composition of these layers was unknown before the probe. Given a low average density, Ceres was expected to have a large amount of water ice under its surface. However, the probe's measurements have confirmed that Ceres is actually composed of a rocky core and a crust of water ice covered by a dusty outer layer. Dawn also uncovered evidence of the presence of clothrate hydrates, a gas trapped in the crystalline structure of the water molecules that makes the amazing strength and low cross density of Ceres possible. While a large portion of Ceres is relatively smooth due to its semi-liquid subsurface layer of ice, the spacecraft found a large mountain that it wasn't able to see previously. This mountain is about 4 kilometers high and is called Ahuna Mons. 
Its well-defined domed shape, similar to volcanoes on Earth, suggests that it was likely formed due to cryovolcanic activity. Although cryovolcanism may exist in other icy worlds, Don's observations make Mount Ahuna the closest known cryovolcano in the solar system. Other observations by the Herschel Space Observatory have shown small amounts of water vapor around several portions of Ceres, which suggests that it may have a weak atmosphere or even ongoing cryovolcanic activity. The probe revealed that this gas could be due to solar particles colliding with the water ice on Ceres, which is then released as vapor, resulting in a temporary, weak atmosphere. Spectroscopic data from Dawn also confirmed the presence of ammonia on the surface of the dwarf planet. Conditions in the main asteroid belt are too warm for ammonia to form, which requires much colder conditions and which raises questions about its origins. Ceres could have formed much further away in the colder, outer portion of the solar system before migrating to its current position, or ammonia could have been brought to Ceres by celestial bodies from the outer solar system. The spacecraft also confirmed the presence of carbonates on Ceres, which had been detected 10 years earlier using telescopic data. A great quantity of them once again confirmed the existence of an ocean early in Ceres' history. This dwarf planet may even be warm enough to have a small amount of liquid water remaining below the surface. It's astonishing that for two centuries the dwarf planet Ceres and Vesta appear to be no more than dim points of light among the stars, until the Dawn mission provided us with detailed investigative portraits of these two complex and fascinating alien worlds. More than 40 years ago, the Voyager space probe, exploring the vicinity of Jupiter, took the first photographs of the bright yellow surface of one of the moons of the giant planet Io, the most volcanically active world in the solar system, with hundreds of volcanoes, some of which erupt lava fountains up to 200 kilometers high and higher. Even then, it was clear that this was an extraordinary, ever-changing world. Besides, it was the Voyager that, for the first time, managed to document Jupiter's radiation belt, which passes right across the line of Io's orbit. It is entirely because of such unfortunate positioning that the level of radiation from the giant planet on its nearest satellite is 1,000 times stronger than the level of radiation on the Earth's surface, which makes finding a person on Io simply impossible. Or possible, but not for long, and ill. Thanks to the data collected by spacecraft such as Voyager 1 and 2, Galileo and New Horizons, we have learned a great deal. But at this very moment, the Juno spacecraft is there, and its data has tremendously expanded our understanding of this hellish place. In fact, Io is slightly larger than our Earth's moon, a mere 5%, and orbits at a distance of just over 400,000 kilometers from Jupiter. This satellite is always pointed at one in the same side of its planet, making a complete revolution around it in 42.5 hours. But the most unusual and exciting thing that the Juno probe registered on the moon of Io was its surface. The tremendous quantity of heat inside the moon, which keeps most of its subsurface crust in a liquid form, seeks any accessible outlet to the surface in order to relieve the pressure. As such, Io's surface is constantly regenerating itself, filling any impact craters with lakes of molten lava. It is assumed that the composition of this material is predominantly molten sulfur, its compounds and silicate rock, which better accounts for an apparent temperature which may be too high. Sulfur dioxide, incidentally, is the primary component of the satellite's atmosphere. Although it is so extremely thin and low in density, that, in fact, it is more correctly referred to as an exosphere, which is filled with volcanic gases. The volcanic atmospheric discharges do not contain water and water steam. Thus, being without water, 
Io significantly differs from the other satellites of Jupiter, the colder Galilean moons. Io's colorful and bright surface appearance is the result of the rigorous work of the volcanoes, which emit various substances in the form of sulfur, dioxide, and silicates. A frosting of sulfur dioxide coats much of the moon's surface, coloring its regions white or gray. In many of the regions, sulfur is also visible due to its yellow and yellow-green color. At mid and high latitudes, radiation is usually broken down by the stable, octatomic cyclic molecules of sulfur, as a result of which, Io's polar regions are colored in a reddish-brown tint. There are no less than 400 formidable volcanoes on Io, and moreover, about 150 can be active at the same time, generating veritable chaos on the surface. Flows of basaltic lava are a common sight in this place. Magma bursts forth onto the surface through inclines on the bottom of pateras, which are formations with a flat bottom and steep walls, or through the cracks in the flat bottoms, creating numerous wide lava flows. During exceptionally large eruptions, such lava flows can stretch for hundreds of kilometers. As a result of volcanic activity, Sulfur dioxide in the form of gas and silicate matter in the form of ash rise to a height of up to 200 kilometers into outer space in the form of a kind of radiation umbrella. And after falling, they color the region red, black, and white. One of the largest volcanic depressions on Io is Loki Patera. With a diameter of 250 kilometers, it is partially filled with molten lava and covered with a hardened, thin crust. Similar lakes are directly connected with the magma reservoir located below them. And since the solidified lava is denser than the molten lava below, this crust can sink, increasing the thermal emissions of the volcano. During an eruption, the wave from the sinking crust spreads across the Patera at a rate of about one kilometer in 12 hours, until the entire lake is again crusted over. Besides volcanoes, there are also mountains on Io that were formed due to the collisions of layers of the lithosphere, the satellite's hard crust. In those places where stone slabs press heavily against each other, massive cliffs have risen from the depths in exactly the same way that mountains appeared on our Earth. Apart from mountains and volcanoes, Io's surface appears to be very smooth, with only a few meteorite impact craters on it. Another amazing characteristic of Io is the dunes, ribbon-like formations that are visible near the volcano Prometheus. It is believed that the hot lava erupting from volcanoes comes into contact with patches of frozen sulfur dioxide and causes it to release heat as a gas. It then expands violently, creating a temporary wind on the surface, enough to throw grains in the form of sand and create dunes. The space probe Juno made the first of nine flights to Io that are planned for the next two years. During two of these flybys, the device will be able to fly to a very close distance from this satellite of Jupiter, about 1,500 kilometers. The spacecraft will make these two close flybys of Io on December 30, 2023 and February 3, 2024. At that time, Juno will study how volcanic eruptions interact with Jupiter's powerful magnetic field and influence the occurrence of polar aurora borealises. Io is arguably one of the most captivating and extraordinary moons of which we know. In addition to being the fourth largest moon in the solar system, it is also the densest of those known. Its bright, multicolored surface is the most volcanically active in the solar system.
largest satellite of Saturn and the second largest satellite in the solar system, after Ganymede, is Titan. Over the decades, we've been learning more and more about this satellite, and they are constantly replenished. So what do we know about Titan? About this world, more than a billion kilometers away from us, is life in one form or another. Really possible there? Let's try to find answers to these and many other questions. So, Titan is a cold, icy world with a surface temperature of minus 170 degrees Celsius, hidden by an orange, hazy atmosphere. Titan has a radius of about 2,500 kilometers and is more than one million kilometers away from Saturn. It takes about 80 minutes for light from the sun to reach Titan, making sunlight there about 100 times fainter than on Earth, which tells us not at all a resort destination. In 15 days and 22 hours, Titan makes a complete revolution around Saturn and is also in synchronous rotation with its planet, meaning it always faces the same side of the planet since Titan rotates roughly along Saturn's equatorial plane. The seasons there last more than seven Earth years, and a year equals 29 Earth years. Titan's internal structure is not fully known, but one model based on data from the Cassini mission suggests that Titan has several layers. The innermost layer is a core of silicate rock, about 3,000 kilometers in diameter. The core is surrounded by a shell of a special type of water ice, which is only found at extremely high pressure. This high pressure ice is then surrounded by a layer of salty liquid water, on top of which is an outer crust of water ice. The surface is covered with organic molecules that have come in with rain or otherwise deposited from the atmosphere in the form of sand and liquids. The atmospheric pressure on Titan is about 60 higher than on Earth. To feel it, you have to go down to a depth of about 15 meters into the ocean. That's how you will feel on Titan. So it's not very comfortable. This is true because the satellite is less massive than the Earth. Its gravity does not hold the gas shell so strongly. So the atmosphere extends to a height 10 times higher than the Earth's almost 600 kilometers into space. Titan's dense atmosphere is mostly composed of nitrogen, about 95, and methane, about 5, with small amounts of other carbon-rich compounds. High in Titan's atmosphere, methane and nitrogen molecules are split by solar ultraviolet and high. Energy particles accelerated in Saturn's magnetic field Parts of these molecules recombine to form various organic chemicals containing carbon and hydrogen, as well as nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen, and other elements important to life on Earth, which is a very curious metamorphosis. Some compounds formed when methane and nitrogen are broken down and recycled create a kind of smog, a thick orange haze that makes Titan's surface hard to see from space. Some of the heavy, carbon-rich compounds settle to the surface, forming a kind of sand on Titan's vast dunes. And methane condenses into clouds that sometimes flood the surface with methane rain. The only mystery for researchers so far is where does the methane itself come from? Since sunlight is constantly destroying it in Titan's atmosphere, there must be some source of replenishment. It is highly likely that the methane could have been spewed into the atmosphere by volcanoes ejecting cooled water instead of molten rock lava. During the Cassini probe mission near Titan, it was possible to obtain images that recorded emissions of a cold substance, presumably liquid methane, into the satellite's atmosphere. At the same time was discovered Mount Doom, the highest mountain on the satellite a height of 1,600 meters, which in all likelihood has a cryovolcanic origin. Two light formations of temporary nature were also discovered, which are the result of the activation of cryovolcanoes that spewed water, ammonia mixture with hydrocarbon admixture. The thickness of ice 
flows on Titan, reaches 200 meters, which is possible due to the high viscosity of cryomagma, comparable to the viscosity of basaltic lava on Earth. But the amazing thing is that in just a few years, huge areas of the landscape shifted during this time by about 30 kilometers. Since Titan is always turned to Saturn on one side, this shift can be explained by the fact that the icy surface is separated from the main mass of the satellite by a liquid layer, an underground liquid ocean, which is most likely associated with the activity of cryovolcanoes on Titan. And one of the sources of energy is most likely a powerful tidal influence of Saturn on its satellite. As for the underground ocean, it is assumed that the water contains a significant amount of ammonia, about 10, which acts as an antifreeze for water and keeps it from freezing. Based on the gravity map of the satellite, it was concluded that the liquid in the subsurface ocean of Titan is characterized by increased density and very high salinity, which includes salt containing sodium, potassium, and sulfur. In addition, the depth of the ocean varies in different areas of the satellite. And yes, hypothetically, there could be something living in ammonia. It's a kind of alternative biochemistry, which explains the possibility of life forms partially or completely different from Earth's. Differences include replacing carbon in organic molecules with other atoms, or replacing water as the universal solvent with other liquids. So don't be surprised if we find a hypertrophied snail with a titanium shell. There are clouds on Titan, but they are quite small. They can cover no more than ones of the surface, although this value sometimes reaches eight. In addition, a huge cloud was recorded at an altitude of 40 kilometers above the North Pole of Titan. This formation consisted most likely of ethane, because only ethane is able to condense at this height. Clouds made of a mixture of methane and organic compounds were also recorded. It is believed that such clouds can make methane, ethane rain or snow, depending on the temperature. Yes, Titan is harsh in any season. Titan's surface is one of the most Earth, like places in the solar system, albeit with much lower temperatures and a different chemical composition. It's so cold here, that rocks form from water ice, like icicles, but licking them is strongly discouraged. Titan's surface is divided into several light and dark areas with clear boundaries. In the area of the equator, there is a famous light region the size of Australia called Xanadu. Also, in the equatorial regions, there are vast areas of dark dunes consisting of hydrocarbon grains, which can resemble coffee grounds mixed with icy sand. Cat scratches is the name given to long parallel rows of dunes stretching for hundreds of kilometers in the direction of prevailing winds, west to east. Images show that Titan's ice dunes are huge, reaching on average up to three kilometers wide, hundreds of kilometers wide hundreds of kilometers long and about 100 meters high, a great place for giant worms to stay. Dust storms are frequent and the different seasons on Titan can affect dramatic changes in the speed of the local winds. It is currently believed that the fastest winds on Titan blow near the equator, the exact speed of which has not been determined. But presumably, for only 30 Earth hours around the entire satellite. During this time, they carry streams of warm air from lower latitudes to the poles of Titan. Perhaps the results of further research will help to find out what really happens on Titan and what weather conditions are formed there during different seasons. Titan has few visible impact craters, meaning its surface must be relatively young and some combination of processes erases impact marks over time. Just as on Earth, craters are erased by the relentless forces of fluid flow, wind, and plate tectonics. These forces are present on Titan in slightly modified forms, according to data and computer calculations. The seas on Titan are mostly composed of ethane and methane. 
There may also be propane and small amounts of hydrogen cyanide, but nay, also be propane and, and acetylene. You know, opening a chemical factory would be no problem. Animations from the photos show periodic changes in the coastline, which is attributed more to the waves. As for the potential for life on Titan, it is probably there, rather than completely absent. We know for sure that Titan hides an ocean of liquid water mixed with salts and ammonia beneath its surface. And this discovery of a global ocean of liquid water adds Titan to the handful of worlds in our solar system that could potentially contain a habitable environment. Yes, it's not suitable for life as we know it. But do we know everything? In addition, rivers, lakes, and seas of liquid methane and ethane could also serve as habitable environments on the surface, though any life there would be very different from life on Earth. Despite the fact that over the years, we have learned quite a lot about this amazing satellite, but, having received new knowledge, more questions were born. The variety of features of Titan's surface is surprising and fascinating. Many people compare it to the Earth. Indeed, its similarity in the form of relief. The presence of seas, rivers, dunes, its atmosphere, which protects from radiation, finds common features with our planet. It is at the same time a world very similar and completely different from our Earth. A unique place in the solar system that requires further study.